Yetta for that wonderful introduction, and thank you for to the uh, English and Comparative Literature Department. I'm very honored to be here and excited to uh, talk over this. I'm talking about Christmas today. What could be more timely in the middle of <laughs> April? I know you all are thinking about Christmas. Uh, so I thought I would just give you a brief um, introduction to the book as a whole, and then just go into this as a third chapter of my book that I'll be focusing on today. So. Better Left Unsaid is in the unseemly position of defending censorship from the central allegations that are traditionally leveled against it. Censorship leads to fewer and duller representations of human sexuality. Censorship squelches political protest. Censorship domesticates and disempowers women. Censorship destroys art. The problem with this insistently destructive formulation is that it gives the censor both too much and too little credit. Too much because it assumes that the censor is shrewdly omnipotent, controlling and restricting the artist's every move, and too little because it assumes that the goals of the censor are necessarily at odds with the goals of the artist. The censor that I describe in my study is at times more fallible, at times more broad-minded than the phantom enemy of free expression so often evoked by the anti-censorship cause. And the artist that I'm describing knows it. Less in contest than in collaboration, the censor and the artist of my account work together to create an elusive, subtextual style of storytelling that is, in many ways, the style best suited to telling tales of sexually and socially subversive desire. To demonstrate this, I focus my attention on the role that censorship played in the shaping of two narrative art forms that are critiqued for their seeming acquiescence to the pressures of propriety, the mainstream Victorian novel and production code era Hollywood film. Although these genres are linked by neither time nor place nor medium, it is my contention that they were governed in very similar manners by very similar rules and regulations with very similar artistic results. These regulations were primarily moral in nature, intended to prevent the highly popular art forms of the novel and the cinema from corrupting the susceptible minds of their young, lower class, and female audiences. But they were also, importantly, extra legal. Hollywood filmmakers chose to embrace the, direction, the, the directives of the Motion Picture Production Code of 1930, also known as the Hayes Code, in order to forestall legal battles at the state and Supreme Court levels, while Victorian novelists chose to censor themselves in order to appease moral reform groups and the conservative sector of their book-buying public. Both types of artists were then affected not by the political censorship of tyrannical governments, but by the more insidious censorship of public opinion, middle class morality, and the marketplace. And in response, both sets of artists could be seen to employ comparable strategies of censorship resistance. Rather than being ruined by censorship, my book argues, the novels written in 19th century England and the films produced under the production code were stirred and stimulated by the very forces meant to restrain them. So this is my third chapter, which was called Beyond Censorship, Charles Dickens and Frank Capra. So, nothing is purer than Christmas, right? Flakes of pure white snow fall upon the Christmas ground. Carolers sing out pure, familiar Christmas songs, and rosy-cheeked children clap with pure delight at the sight of Christmas feasts and Christmas presents. But it is more than that. Christmas, the Christmas season also brings about a mystical social transformation. Greed is replaced by generosity. Cynicism is replaced by sympathy. Corruption is replaced by righteousness. We know this is true because we've been told it is true, year in and year out, ever since we were rosy-cheeked children ourselves. We have heard about a crotchety old miser transformed overnight into the most munificent of givers, and about a tiny crippled child whose life is saved by the Christmas miracle of charity. We have seen a man who is on the brink of suicide realize that the unglamorous small-town life he leads is in fact a wonderful life, and as his friends and neighbors amiably empty their pockets to rescue him from financial ruin. We have seen and read and learned all this from two of our culture's most beloved and most perennial of classics, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol from 1843 and Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life from 1946. Christmas simply would not be Christmas without them. What then can such revered and sacred texts possibly have to do with the issue at hand, the question of censorship? Who, in other words, would ever want to censor Christmas? Interestingly, the holiday of Christmas has played an influential role in the histories of both English literary and Hollywood film censorship. Uh, did it go? No. No? No, I got it. There. Um, so, as Frank Fowle and Frank Palmer describe in their detailed study of censorship in England, the office of the English dramatic censor originated in the figure of the Lord of Misrule, who, in medieval times, was put in charge of selecting entertainment for the royal court to be performed in the weeks leading up to Christmas. 
Over time, the ephemeral and irresponsible powers that belonged to the Lord of Misrule became more structured and official in nature, and the post was provided with a less anarchic sounding name, Master of Revels. It was in this incarnation that the post began to take on a more directly censorious role. According to Fallon Palmer, quote, the Master of Revels was held responsible for the inoffensiveness and general success of these court entertainments, and for his own credit's sake, it was necessary for him to discriminate between good and bad plays. Eventually, too, the Master of Revels was put in charge of licensing the printed versions of the plays in question, thereby making him a direct ancestor of the modern literary censor. Tony Tanner has remarked upon the inherently paradoxical nature of this censorship ancestry. Quote, titles like Lord of Misrule and Master of Revels suggest a responsibility which looks two ways. The master must make sure that the revels take place, thus he has originally to organize them and help them into expressive form. At the same time, he must master them, control, and delimit the form they take. Plays produced specifically for medieval Christmas festivities were then the first English narratives on record to be influenced by the simultaneously productive and repressive powers of moral censorship. In the world of film, meanwhile, there is a clear and much analyzed link between the implementation of Hollywood's production code and the pressures of Christian and in particular Catholic morality groups. In fact, the issue of film censorship first gained national attention in the United States during the Christmas boycott of 1908, when a coalition of New York ministers pressured Mayor George B. McLennan into closing down all New York movie theaters on Christmas Day in order to make the statement to movie makers that, as Gregory Black has put it, quote, unless they took some action to clean up their image, improve the physical conditions of the theaters, and most important, address the concern of critics that movies were corrupting children and adults, they could expect continued attacks by moral guardians who would continue to press for restrictive legislation, end quote. Ironically, uh, Christmas also played a major role in the groundbreaking uh, Supreme Court miracle decision of 1952 that finally gave movies protection under the First Amendment and paved the way for the dissolution of Hays Code censorship. The decision was made in response to, the, to a legal dispute over the banning of The Miracle from 1948, Roberto Rossellini's allegedly sacrilegious film about a peasant woman who is seduced and impregnated by a vagrant stranger but convinces herself that she is experiencing a modern day version of Mary's Immaculate Conception. The two Christmas stories that I will be examining in the course of this talk do not have such a direct connection to the legal history of, of artistic censorship. In fact, their authors were two of the most popular, least objectionable artists of their respective eras. The stories themselves, meanwhile, have become so much a part of our cultural consciousness that they have, to borrow Paul Davis's terminology, reached the seemingly untouchable status of culture text. Um, though there is certainly much in the writing and filming of A Christmas Carol and It's a Wonderful Life that warrants the critical and popular acclaim they have achieved, I would argue that the reason that they, out of all of Dickens and Capra's, Capra's works, have reached such a lofty status lies in their inescapable association with the holiday of Christmas. It is precisely because of this association that I have chosen to examine the text under the thematic lens of censorship. My goal is to determine the role that censorship plays in the production and reception of even the most mainstream, family-friendly, respectable of texts, texts that appear to be beyond reproach, beyond censorship. So Charles Dickens' relationship with censorship was undeniably shaped by his desire to be popular, accepted, and widely read. As Josh Marsh has aptly put it, quote, Dickens never despaired of pleasing and was determined that no prejudice should stand in the way of thoroughly respectable and remunerative success. <laughs> Though this determination on Dickens' part could be construed as a form of pandering to his audience, as well as to the moral censors of his time, it could also be seen as a reflection of his lifelong efforts to increase the status of the literary profession in terms of its social respectability. Sam Buddha Sen has recently argued that Dickens' deepening commitment to respectability over the course of his career led to a gradual softening of the political satire in his work, but also that this softening allowed his satire to, quote, cater not only to a radical Artis artisanal community, but to the middle classes as well." End quote. To a certain extent, of course, Dickens' desire to appeal as to as broad an audience as possible was selfishly motivated. As the son of a debt-ridden Navy payroll clerk, Dickens wanted his own role as a highly successful professional writer to provide him with that much-coveted treasure in the Victorian world, upward social mobility. But that desire was also tied into a larger philanthropic vision uh, that Dickens had for the artistic community as a whole. If art was ever going to be seen as truly dignified in Dickens' mind, it simply could not afford to be regarded as immoral or obscene. But this is not to say that Dickens' desire for social acceptability was the only motivating force that informed his art. He was also, as Edgar Johnson has put it, 
uh, deeply skeptical of the whole system of re respectable attitudes and conventional beliefs that cemented all of society into a monolithic structure stubbornly resistant to significant change. To a writer who considered psychological and social truth to be essential ingredients of any novel worth reading, this system posed a very real threat indeed. Like Dickens, Frank Capra prided himself on being an uncompromising artist, but also like Dickens, Capra made sure that his popular appeal and economic success were not too compromised by the proclivities of his artistic vision either. As a Sicilian-born peasant who immigrated to America when he was six and maneuvered his way up the social and financial ladder by sheer force of will and hard work, Capra valued success with a passion that bordered on obsession. As he says in the first lines of the preface to his autobiography, quote, I hated being poor, hated being a peasant, hated being a scrounging news carrier trapped in the sleazy Sicilian ghetto of Los Angeles. My family couldn't read or write. I wanted out. And out he got. By the 1930s, Capra was one of the best paid, most popular, most reliable makers of Hollywood smash hits. Paradoxically, then, Capra's burning desire for creative autonomy, quote, I take a very dim view of authority of any kind. I don't like anybody telling me what to do was consistently tempered by his overall willingness to follow the dictates of social decorum. Quote, in short, the audience is always right is a safe bet. Those are quotes from Capra. Not surprisingly, both of these com conflicting drives played an important role in the development of Capra's complex relationship to censorship. Many critics has, have, of course, compared Dickens' Carol to Capra's Wonderful Life. The reasons for such comparisons are fairly obvious. Both text plots revolve uh, around the education and ultimately the moral redemption of their erring protagonists. Both contain the unwanted intrusion of supernatural spirits. Both rely on the m machinery of retrospection. Scro Scrooge looks back over the course of his own life. Clarence look back, looks back over the course of George Bailey's, followed by the machinery of counterfactuals. Scrooge gets to see what life will be like if he does not change his miserly ways. George gets to see what life would be like if he had never been born. And most obviously of all, both are pr pr proudly and ostentatiously set during the Christmas holiday season. Less well known, perhaps, is the fact that both A Christmas Carol and It's a Wonderful Life were conceived at particularly uneasy moments of their authors' careers. Dickens was in the middle of serializing his least financially successful work, Martin Chuzzlewit, which was doing so poorly that it suddenly became the rage, according to one review, to decrive Dickens by pronouncing his Chuzzlewit a failure and his writings vulgar and whispering Boz is going down. Dickens was not quite so indifferent to the public's moral criticism of his work as he professed himself to be in his famous anti-censorship preface to Oliver Twist. He referred in his letters to his Chuzzlewit agonies and was both mortified and enraged when his publishers threatened to reduce his monthly payment by 50 pounds as a result of the book's disappointingly sluggish sales. Capra, meanwhile, was newly returned from his four-year tour of duty in World War II and was extremely nervous that he would not be able to regain the directorial territorial glory of his pre-war years. Quote, there's no denying that butterflies began putting on their own private air show in my stomach, he confesses in his autobiography. How would a Ruth, Gehrig, or DiMaggio feel if he hadn't swung a bat for four years and was suddenly asked to hit a home run in Yankee Stadium? Capra's sense of trepidation was, moreover, compounded by the fact that his first post-war film would inaugurate the, in the independent production company that he had recently formed with William Wyler, George Stevens, and Samuel Briskin, causing him to feel that, quote, I was not only carrying the load of making Wonderful Life a successful picture, I had to make a success out of Liberty Films. We were the bellwether of the post-war independence. For both Dickens and Capra then, there was an enormous pressure to come up with stories that would appeal to a wide audience and reconfirm their status as major box office draws. At the same time, however, we must bear in mind that the years of 1843 and 1946 were periods of intense social reflection for Dickens and Capra, respectively. The plate of the poor weighed very heavily on Dickens' mind in 1843, thanks largely to two parliamentary reports issued by the Child Employment Commission that publicly exposed the appalling conditions of child labor in England. In response to these reports, Dickens told friends that he planned to write, quote, a very cheap pamphlet called An Appeal to the People of England on Behalf of the Poor Man's Child. Although this pamphlet never materialized, Dickens explained his decision not to write it by assuring his social reformer friends that, quote, when you see what I do and where and how, you will certainly feel that a sledgehammer has come down with 20 times the force, 20,000 times the force I could exert by following out my first idea. Several months after making this assurance, just after giving a rousing speech at the Man Manchester Athenaeum about the need for educational reform for the poor, Dickens finally convinced a, a conceived of a very different way to hammer home his political message by dressing it up and serving it as a crowd-pleasing Christmas treat. 
1946, Capra was emotionally preoccupied with what he perceived to be, quote, the cataclysmic aftermath of war, hunger, disease, despair that would breed gnawing doubts in man. Why, why, why did my wife and children have to be blown to bits? Where is God now? End quote. But Di like Dickens, Capra came to realize that the best way to address the world's gnawing doubts would be in an indirect fashion. When contemplating what the subject matter of his first post-war film should be, he says that he specifically, quote, knew one thing, it would not be about war. Instead, Capra chose to adapt a short story by Philip Van Doren Stern, a story so short, in fact, that it had originally been circulated as, as Stern's 1943 Christmas card to his friends and family. The story is certainly not about war, but it is important to note that it is not too much about Christmas either. The opening lines of the story are indicative of the peripheral role that the Yuletide setting plays in both Van Doren Stern's Christmas card and Capra's filmic adaptation of it. Quote, the little town straggling up the hill was bright with colored Christmas lights, but George Pratt did not see them. He was leaning over the railing of the Iron Bridge, staring down moodily into the black water. Ironically, then, the modern world's two most celebrated Christmas narratives are a ghost story and a suicide story that do not deal in any direct way with the biblical birth of Christ. Excuse me. Despite the fact that both texts have garnered a certain amount of criticism for their secular natures, criticism along the line of Margaret Oliphant's gripe that the carol promoted only, quote, the immense spiritual power of the Christmas turkey, the, rea <laughs> <laughs> the reality is that the forces of moral censorship work to minimize the text's religiosity rather than to augment it. Indeed, with the exception of the opening set of prayers that serve as the expository foundation of the film, Joseph Breen's string of recommendation letters Joseph Breen was the head of the Production Code Administration. I guess I don't introduce him earlier. Um, they asked Capra to cut out almost all of It's a Wonderful Life's most direct references to God and Jesus in phrases such as, I wish to God, thank God, ah, Dio mio, and a comment made by Uncle Billy to George about the place your father used to try to run like he thought Jesus would run it. They all get cut out uh, for fear that they, would not be, uh, they were not being used reverently enough. Following a similar logic, the London Censorship Board even attempted to make Capra remove all references to heaven, wings, and angels before the film was released in England. But after pleading with the censors not to ruin our first independent production and assuring them that all United States censor boards have hailed picture just as the type of clean, wholesome entertainment they all cry for, Capra was able to get most of his wings and angels through to the British public after all. Even before these official objections were raised, however, Capra's desire to obtain his more audience's moral stamp of approval had a strong impact on the way he chose to present the film's religious content. Um, as he explained to a reporter later on, for a long time we were worried about how to show heaven. I knew we wouldn't please everybody, and I knew we'd probably get some laughs with the thing that we naturally didn't want. So rather than getting laughs that we didn't want, I used laughs we did want. This was, in a way, a way out of a difficulty, but a conscious way. When a thing gets tough, try to make it funny and it'll go over. It's like Mae West with her sex. If you make it funny, you can get away with murder. So heaven was humorous this way, and it didn't offend anybody. As little as Wonderful Life's divine moments may seem to have in common with the saucy body humor of Mae West, Capra does manage to portray heaven in a relatively unholy, unspiritual way without raising objections from even his most devoutly religious viewers. Capra's angels do not talk about the pearly gates or eternal salvation or Jesus or Mary or God for that matter. Instead, they focus on what the audience is focusing on, sitting back and watching a good movie. Sit down, Joseph instructs Clar Clarence. If you're going to help a man, you want to know something about him, don't you? Interestingly, Joseph Breen appears to have had no problem with Capra's secular approach to representing the afterlife. The scenes in heaven are not so much as mentioned in any of the five recommendation letters that Breen wrote in response to early drafts of the film. Apparently, the Catholic-based pr production code considered it to be more acceptable for a film to avoid religious discourse altogether than to contain discourse that might be considered blasphemous by any of the members of its audience. Although we do not have quite such formal evidence of uh, censorship's influence on the secularization of the carol, I did want to just mention that all of the images that I'm using from A Christmas Carol, the il illustrations from the original text, and Charles Dickens would have actually asked John Leach, who was the illustrator, to draw these specific scenes, and he would have authorized them. So that's the only visual representations as I'm giving you, as opposed to the thousands of remakes of it that you all are probably familiar with. But these are all 
Dickens okayed visuals. Um, so although we do not have such quite formal evidence of censorship's influence on the secularization of the carol, we do know that Dickens made several last minute textual changes to the galleys that seem to have been based on, the fear, on his fear of offending his audience's sense of religious decorum. For example, the ghost of Christmas presents reason for sprinkling his spirit lifting incense upon the dinner of poor men is changed from because my eldest brother, meaning Jesus, took them especially under his protection to because it needs most. Um, in addition to excising some of his most direct references to religious subject matter, Dickens also relied on the heavenly strategy outlined by Capra. He sprinkled his account of spirits and spiritual salvation with a hearty dose of genial Dickensian humor. This strategy did not work on everyone, of course. In response, for example, to the Carol's lighthearted assertion that, quote, it is good to be children sometimes and never better than at Christmas when its mighty founder was a child himself, a reviewer in the Anglican periodical The Christian Remembrancer criticized the extreme irreverence of this way of speaking and advised Dickens that his expunging or altering the sentence in the next edition will give general satisfaction. Mm -hmm. Such complaints notwithstanding, the vast majority of Dickens' readers were more than satisfied with his way of speaking in the carol as irreverent and or irreligious as it may have been. In fact, as critics like Paul Davis have pointed out, Dickens' Christmas stories seem to have been specifically catered toward the secularized, secularized sensibilities of his Victorian London reading public. Quote, writing for these new urban readers, Davis asserts, Dickens sought to express spiritual truth in the humanized language and self of the self-mirroring secular city. In a way, then, the secular nature of Dickens and Capra's seminal Christmas text can be understood less as a form of rebellion against the conservatively religious ethos of Victorian and Hayes Code era systems of censorship than as a paradoxical result of that ethos. Ultimately, the moral censor's fear of blasphemy both promoted and provoked the secularization of Dickens and Capra's narrative art. But what we might ask is the secular message that is being promulgated in these texts in the place of a religious one, and what role does censorship play in that message's creation and repression? As Mrs. Oliphant's quip about Dickens' undue emphasis on the Christmas turkey implies, the most obvious thematic statements be being made by the text are socioeconomic in nature, and yet the exact nature of those statements is anything but obvious. Both works spend a great deal of narrative energy pointing out and bemoaning the economic injustices of the modern world's capitalist system, and cast as their villains characters who personify the cutthroat potential of that system, the unreformed Scrooge and the never-reformed Potter. At the same time, however, some recent critics have begun to argue that the texts actually work to reinforce an essentially conservative capitalist ideology. J. Hillis Miller, for instance, has commented upon the fact that at the end of the carol, quote, Scrooge is not supposed to give up his business, nor is he to cease to go daily on change, nor is the capitalist system of getting, spending, production, and exchange supposed to be altered in any basic way. While Wonderful Life has been criticized for being a self-deluded proponent of unself-interested capitalism, which is of necessity an oxymoron. Because Dickens and Capra's res resolutely mainstream texts participate so conspicuously in the commodity culture of literary and cinematic production, such critics argue, their authors cannot help but have a personal investment in making the economic system at the heart of that culture look good. And what better way to cast a positive light upon the buying and selling of goods than by broaching the subject of Christmas, that phantasmatic season during which, to borrow Audrey Jaffe's phrase, laissez-faire economics is happily wedded to natural benevolence. <laughs> this dynamic of dressing capitalism in the red and white robes of Father Christmas intriguingly reflects the role of the censor in shaping novels and films, like the Lord of Misrule, both inviting and restraining merriment. Just as Dickens and Capra clearly had a personal and professional stake in the success of capitalism, so too did the system of moral censorship under which they were forced to operate, the censorship of the marketplace. This can be seen most explicitly in the case of the production code. As I outlined in my book's introduction, Hollywood's decision to adopt the 1930 production code only a few months after the stock market crash of 1929 was unmistakably, inf unmistakably influenced by the economic ramifications of the crash. If Hollywood wanted to keep as much of its box office revenue as possible in the face of the depression, the thinking went, it had better start trying to offend as few of its potential viewers as possible. Because the very genesis of the code was so market driven in nature, it is no surprise that classical Hollywood filmmakers consistently found themselves being encouraged by code and administrators to create works that would defend and uphold the capitalist status quo. This type of encouragement gained new momentum when the infamous House Un-American Activities Committee, or HUAC, began to question Hollywood's relationship to communism in the years following World War II. Throughout this post-war slash Cold War era, the PCA attempted to suppress any messages that they thought HUAC 
would consider to be communist or anti-capitalist in nature, suddenly subjecting filmmakers to an even stricter censorship policies than the production code had originally established. As many film scholars have noted, one, one of the primary ways that the PCA believed it could control the messages of Hollywood films was by forcing filmmakers to conclude their narratives on all ideological on ideologically conservative notes. This pressure came under the heading of the rule of compensating moral values, a rule that never technically appeared in the production code, but, was, but that was cited time and time again by code administrators in their recommendation letters to filmmakers over the years. According to this rule, filmmakers were permitted to portray morally objectionable morally objectionable behavior if and only if that behavior was criticized, vilified, and punished in the end. Depravity must be defeated. Goodness and capitalism must prevail. The respective endings of A Christmas Carol and It's a, Winter, it's a Wonderful Life certainly appear to satisfy the censor's demand for compensating moral values, particularly when it comes to their depiction of capitalism as in a morally complementary light. Both endings hinge, of course, on the psychological transformation and moral salvation of their story's misguided protagonists. But if we look closely at what each protagonist is called upon to do in his text's final moments, at how he is called upon to change, we can see the ideological imprint of the moral censor. In order to become better men, both protagonists must learn to become better capitalists. Uh, Scrooge's redemption manifests itself in his newfound appreciation for the spending side of the economic equation, exemplified famously by his purchase of not the little prize turkey, the big one. The more money George Scrooge spends, the better and purer we know he has become. While well, George's salvation comes when he learns to participate in the profit side of the equation. After a lifetime of not making a dime out of his family's successful building and loan, George must ultimately give in and allow his customers to pay him a proper monetary compensation for his efforts. Efforts. In the end, then, the Christmas miracles depicted, depicted in A Christmas Carol and It's a Wonderful Life are not religious but economic in nature. In the former, the miracle is that Scrooge finally gives his clerk a raise. In the latter, the miracle, as Mary Bailey even explicitly calls it, I hear them now, George, it's a miracle, it's a miracle, is that George's friends pile into his living room and hand him a basket full of cash. And yet, as much as the happy endings of the text may appear to serve as ringing Christmas card endorsements of capitalist consumerism, it's important to note that they are not the only endings that Dickens and Capra provide for us. Because the texts employ the machinery of the counterfactual, counterfactual conditional, each of them is given the opportunity to pick two alternate endings, one of which only one of which need paint capitalism in a glowingly optimistic light. The alternate ending of It's a Wonderful Life can, of course, be found in the dark and seedy Pottersville dream sequence that shows George what life would have been like if he had never been born. Although the dialogue used in the sequence never addresses the issue of capitalism or consumerism in a direct manner, the most it even refers to banking is when George is informed that his family's business went out of business years ago. The message of the sequence is as glaringly obvious as the flashing neon signs of the nightclubs, liquor stores, pool halls, and pawn shops that line Pottersville's main street. If Potter's brand of no-holds-barred, purely profit-based economics is allowed to triumph over George's more community-based brand, then the moral fabric of Bedford Falls society will utterly and irrevoc irrevocably disintegrate. This is, in fact, precisely the if-then scenario that George has been warning his friends and neighbors about throughout the film. Quote, this town needs this this town needs this measly one horse institution if only to have some place where people can come without crawling to Potter, excuse me, and if Potter gets hold of this building and loan, there'll never be a decent house built in this town. Those are quotes from George. But it is only in the Pottersfield dream sequence that we are able to follow George's premonitions to their darkest and most disturbing economic conclusions. Everything in Pottersville is crudely for sale. Nick, the bartender, now turned bar owner, sells hardcore inebriation. We serve hard drinks in here for men who want to get drunk fast. George's mother, now the coldly suspicious proprietor of Ma Bales, Ma Bailey's boarding house sells her home. Violet Bick, now an out-and-out -out prostitute, sells her body. Those who do not or cannot participate in the sales game, moreover, are brutally punished for it. Uncle Billy, the epitome of the inept businessman, has been in the insane asylum ever since he lost his business, while Mary, who refuses to marry for money, as is seen in her rejection of the exceptionally wealthy same Wainwright, has become a, become a meek and pitiable old maid. 
As George stumbles through this nightmarish revision of the life he once knew, Capra emph emphasizes the disparity between the world of Bedford Falls and the world of Pottersville by abruptly switching into an entirely new cinematic genre. As Robin Wood has put it, quote, the iconography of small town comedy is exchanged unmistakably for that of film noir, with police sirens shooting in the streets, darkness, vicious dives, alcoholism, burlesque shows, strip clubs, and the glitter and shadows of noir lighting. Unlike, under the glare of this new lighting, Potter's fairly standard capitalist ambitions to make more and more money, to own more and more property, to achieve greater and greater socioeconomic success, are suddenly made to look monstrous, lurid, and morally unsound. The Carol's alternate ending, meanwhile, occurs in its bleakly futuristic fourth stave as Scrooge is guided through the terrifying landscape of what his end will be if he does not change his miserly ways. Although the section of this stave that is most remembered and most often dramatized in film and television versions of the tale is the section that shows the Cratchit's mourning the death of Tiny Tim, there are several lesser known, less reenacted episodes that lead up to it, each of which, which paints a rather grim portrait of the inner workings of capitalism. Scrooge starts his Christmas yet to come journey by finding himself on a change among the merchants who hurried up and down and chinked the money in their pockets and conversed in groups and looked at their watches and trifled thoughtfully with their great gold seals and so forth. These business merchants are depicted, for the most part, as unappealing ogres. One is a great fat man with a monstrous chin. Another is a red-faced gentleman with a pendulous excrescence on the end of his nose that shook like the gills of a turkey cock. But they're also, more importantly, portrayed as heartless, callous individuals who can yawn and laugh about a man's death and focus more on the economics of the situation than anything else. What has he done with his money, asks one. It's likely to be a very cheap funeral, remarks another. I don't mind going if a lunch is provided, chuckles a third. As grotesque as the businessman's financial discussion of Scrooge's death may be, however, their grotesqueness is one-upped by the scene that follows. In it, Scrooge watches his servants pawn the possessions of his that they have managed to steal away from his death chamber, and indeed from his dead body. The charwoman has gone so far as to rob him of the clothes that he has been dressed in for his burial. Scrooge regards the actions of these servants as examples of profiteering taken to a diabolic extreme. He viewed them, we were told, with a detestation and disgust which could hardly have been greater though they had been obscene demons marketing the corpse itself. To Suze's sense of moral revulsion, Scrooge asks the ghost of Christmas yet to come to take him to see any person in the town who feels emotion caused by this man's death. In response to this request, the ghost brings Scrooge to the home of a kind young couple and their children who have nothing monstrous or deme demonic about them. But even in this house of warmth and goodness, the pressures imposed by Victorian England's economic system cause the family to have a reaction to death that is no less callous than the business merchants or less profit-driven than the servants. Because it, is, it means a timely delay in the repayment of their debt to Scrooge, the family morbidly delights in the news of their creditors passing. Quote, soften it as they would, their hearts were lighter. Their children's faces, hushed and clustered round to hear what they were so little understood, were brighter. And it was happier. It was a happier house for this man's death. In the, both the Pottersville section of It's a Wonderful Life and the futuristic fourth section of A Christmas Carol, then, we are shown the darker, seedier, uglier results of capitalism. Interestingly, however, neither section aroused much disapproval from the moral censors of its time. Indeed, when looking through the pages and pages of objections that Joseph Breen raised in response to the various drafts of A Wonderful Life that were submitted to his office, one is struck by the near total absence of complaints directed toward the content of the Pottersville sequence. Similarly, one would be hard-pressed to find so much as a sentence written by one of Dickens' contemporaries that finds fault with the socio-political implications of his Christmas yet to come. All in all, both Dickens and Capra seem to have been extremely successful in achieving the goal of inoffensiveness that Dickens specifically describes in his pithy preface to the carol. Quote, I have endeavored in this ghostly little book, he writes, to raise that ghost of an idea which shall not put my readers out of humor with themselves, with each other, with the season, or with me. May it haunt their house pleasantly, and no one wish to lay it. One reason I would argue that the social criticism of the Carol and Wonderful Life so successfully avoids putting readers, viewers, and censors out of humor with the text lies largely in the counterfactual positioning of that criticism. According to the official plotline of each narrative, it is, after all, the unrelenting bleakness of the alternate universe that is the fiction, the fabrication, the hallucination, while the reassuring optimism of the happy ending is the diegetic reality. Understanding the importance of this fiction reality distinction from a censorship perspective, both Dickens and Capra take great pains within their texts to prove to us that their final moments are, in fact, real. Do I have? Oh, that didn't happen. What happened? <laughs> well, let me get back to it. I see it. Okay. And, uh, no, no. Uh, oh, it 
doesn't want to go to it anymore. Huh. Bro, it's going crazy. <laughs> well, there are only a couple more slides you can deal with. Yes, this is being censored. <laughs> censored. They don't want to show you these last slides. It's okay. I'm almost done. Um, so, where was I? George has to make sure that he has really woken up from his Pottersville nightmare by verifying the empirical evidence of his bloody lift, his, his smashed up car, Zuzu's pedals in his pocket, and the corporality of his non-Liberian wife. Mary, let me touch you, are you real? Scrooge, meanwhile, has to keep insisting to the people he encounters that he and his reformed state is real. Um, and moreover, in the case of the Christmas Carol, the omniscient narration works to re reinforce our sense of what is real and what is not, for even though the ghost of Christmas yet to come refuses to tell Scrooge whether or not his reformed actions will be able to alter the tragic future events that he has witnessed, Dickens' narrator not does specifically tell us that, quote, Scrooge was better than his word, he did it all, and infinitely more, and to Tiny Tim, who did not die, in capital letters, he was a second father. In this one capitalized phrase, the question of diegetic reality is flatly answered for us. If Tiny Tim does not die, then we know once and for all that stay for is merely a dream and that goodness and innocence do really prevail. Yet in spite of all this textual insistence that we can and should believe in the story's happy endings, many readers and viewers over the years have had a hard time doing so. Some of these disbelievers have chosen mentally to rewrite the ending of the particular text in question in a more plausible fashion. See, for example, Edmund Wilson's famous New Yorker article from 1939, in which he tries to imagine what Scrooge would actually be like if he were to follow him beyond the frame of the story, and comes to the conclusion that he would relapse when the merriment was over, if not while it was still going on, into moroseness, vindictiveness, suspicion, Suspicion. He would, that is to say, reveal himself as the victim of a manic depressive cycle and a very uncomfortable person. Others, meanwhile, have chosen to simply disregard their story's ending or to push the ending back to what they would consider to be a more believable point in the story. See William S. Pector's essay from 1962 in which he insists that for those who can accept the realities of George Bailey's situation, the continual frustration of his ambitions, his envy of those who have done what he has only wanted to do, the collapse of his business, a sense of utter isolation, final despair, and and do not believe in angels, the film ends, in effect, with the hero's suicide. But it is not only the presence of supernatural angels and ghosts in the text that prevents the readers and viewers from trusting fully in the happy endings that are provided for them. There is, I would argue, one other major element of those endings that distinctly stands in plausibility's way, the element of excess. In my book chapter, I describe many ways in which both Dickens and Capra deploy the strategy of excess to imbue their text with an overall impression of joyfulness, hopefulness, and family-friendly inoffensiveness, and draw the moral censor's attention away from the darker, bitter sentiments at, that lie at the text's cores. But since that section is, not surprisingly, the chapter's wordiest section, it's the one that I'm going to skip over today. Uh, as much, though, as It's a Wonderful Life may leave us with the impression that it has depicted Christmas as a warm and winsome symbol of normative domestic bliss. Change slide, but I'm not going to do that. Uh, the truth is that it gives us one of classical Hollywood's uh, starkest portrayals of the desolate, despondent feeling a man may get when the spirit of Christmas and of small town American life has left him out in the cold. And this portrayal was no accident on Capra's part, as he makes clear in an interview from the early 1980s. Uh, when explaining why two of his most emotionally powerful works, Meet John Doe from 1941 and Wonderful Life, just so happened to pair the setting of Christmas with the theme of suicide, Capra points out that, quote, Christmas makes people vulnerable, vulnerable, brings out deep feelings. No one is neutral. People either feel more joyous or sadder. It's a time when people feel lonely or more abandoned. There are many suicides that time of year. Capra is here echoing a sentiment that is briefly but emphatically impress, e expressed within the text of the carol. As one of the portly gentlemen who is soliciting Christmas donations for the poor explains to Scrooge, quote, we choose this time because it is a time of all others when want is keenly felt and abundance rejoices. This critique of financial inequity really is at the heart of Dickens' text, and the way that Dickens manages to impart such criticism while still maintaining the carol's aura of benign holiday cheer is by stressing the fact that the Merry Christmas is portrayed within it are merry in spite of his character's wretched financial situations. This is most obviously true in the case of the Cratchits, but the ghost of Christmas present shows us many other cheery in spite of everything Christmas celebrations as well. Celebrations of lowly miners, lighthouse attendants, sailors, all of whom are able to enjoy the warmth of Christmas even in the midst of their bleak, desolate, dreadful surroundings. How did they do it? Dickens specifically tells us it is a feat of Christmas magic in the form of laced incense sprinkled by the ghost upon more poor men's Christmas dinners. 
quote, the spirit took beside sick beds and they were cheerful, on foreign lands and they were close at home, by struggling men and they were patient in the greater hope, by poverty and it was rich. The problem with this kind of Christmas miracle is, of course, that it is so short-lived. The ghost can only work his wonders but one day a year. By turning hope and patience and wealth and good cheer into gifts that are artificially and temporarily bestowed, Dickens reveals Christmas to be a bright and shiny facade that merely cloaks the social, moral, and economic failures of his society. At the end of the third stave, in fact, Dickens goes so far as to literal literalize this rather cynical view of Christmas Hidden beneath the skirts of the genial, unconstrained, joyful ghost of Christmas present, we discover two children, a boy and girl, who are described in the most pejorative language Dickens can muster. Wretched, abject, frightful, hideous, and miserable, as well as yellow, meager, ragged, scowling, wolfish. They are the human incarnations of ignorance and want, and even though we are specifically told that they belong to man, we can see that they cling steadfastly to Christmas. The image of these horrifying creatures skulking behind the curtain of the spirit's rich and plentiful robes stands as an excellent metaphor for the thematic double standard being practiced in A Christmas Carol and It's a Wonderful Life. In both texts, we are left with enough diegetic wiggle room to interpret the morals of the stories as we see fit. Because the texts were required by the forces of moral censorship to adhere to certain well-known structural rules, for example, the rule of compensating moral values, Dickens and Capra were able to infuse them with ordinarily censorable sentiments, distrust of capitalist ideology, bitterness towards com the confinement of domestic life, antipathy toward Christmas, without inciting too much shock or controversy. But if censorship in this way allows for powerful social criticism to enter into the most family-friendly of popular entertainment, it also allows for a formidably affirmative power to reach even the most sophisticated of cynics. For as much as the skulking horrors of humanity may haunt these texts, theirs are not the voices that carry. Far more resonant on a cultural level are the sounds of tender, childish optimism. Tiny Tim's, God bless us, everyone, and Zuzu Bailey's, every time a bell rings, an angel gets his wings, with which each author chooses to end his narrative. When taken out of context, these lines smack of mawkish sentiment sentimentality. But when, after having plunged with George Bailey into the abyss of suicide and with Ebenezer Scrooge into a spectral sea of crime and punishment, we are finally permitted to come gasping back up for air, we find that the cloyingly sentimental has transmuted into the authentically euphoric. Whether we choose to read these euphoric endings as the fantasy or the reality of the counterfactual stories we are being told, it is difficult to resist their urgent pull towards a brand of joy that manages to lie just outside the reach of censorship, improper in its exorbitance, indecorous in its immoderateness, indecent in its unapologetic excess. Thank you.